and good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome to Let's Crack Neat UG English. We are on our chapter Breathing and Exchange of Gases, and uh, we will continue with what we have done earlier. Uh, that is the respiratory system. So we are going to continue with the same. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Anusha. How are you? So I guess people, all the students are going to join in uh, now. <clears throat> Uh, I'm sure you must be getting the notifications uh, for all these uh, uh, classes or the lectures, right? <clears throat> and if you get the notification, what is that time when you get the notification? Hello, Amicha. Because once I start the class, after that the students start to join in. So I guess... Um, just a minute before the class, you must be getting the notifications. So, Anusha, Misha, fuzzy artist. Okay. Did you get a chance to go over all those things which we have done uh, yesterday? And was there anything which was difficult or did you have any kind of a doubt? <clears throat> because that is what we will take up first and then we will start with what we have planned hello Padma uh, are you joining this class for the first time Padma Uh, Dilip is asking capsule. Capsules in uh, what? There are so many places where we use a capsule word. Capsule anything is like whichever is enclosed or uh, a cover. <coughs> Anupriya. Okay, you used to watch my videos. Uh, the live classes or the recorded ones? Because the students who are uh, on the live classes, uh, you know, I get to see their names like when we uh, interact, you message. So I remember the names that way. Yeah, that is why the recorded ones. And that is why I have not seen your name uh, on the live sessions. <clears throat> Dilip uh, is asking in nasal chamber. Uh, see, chamber is a compartment and if it is covered with something, then you can call it capsule. So capsule word is used for anything which is surrounded by something. A space which is surrounded by something or a structure which is surrounding by, uh, surrounded by something. So if a structure is surrounded by something, we call it encapsulated. Like if you have heard of uh, tumors, the malignant tumor and benign tumor. For benign tumor also we say it is encapsulated. <clears throat> so capsule word is for a covered thing. Okay, so I guess, uh, yeah, good afternoon, Reshma. Uh, I guess we have, we can get started now and as you can see, uh, we will be talking about uh, the things which we have done earlier also, that is we have talked of bronchi, we will talk about lungs, the branchial intercom and then we will come to the mechanism of breathing. So let's go over uh, our basic things first. That is uh, the platform that we are using, the teacher. So I guess all of uh, you who are with me today, they know me, so we can skip this. 
<coughs> and an academy platform we are using right now we are on the youtube channel that is let's crack meet ug english uh, which is an academy's youtube channel and i'm also taking classes on the an academy learning app so in case if you have not installed this app you can do that or rather i would say you should do it because <coughs> very soon i will be conducting a quiz on the app because the features which we are able to get uh, on the app for conduction of these quizzes are very nice so that makes the quiz interesting also time bound also so uh, you should install this uh, app it is available on your app store and these things i have already told you that plus subscription then there is one iconic subscription in plus apart from the daily classes structured courses live tests you also have an unlimited access to the various uh, tutors who are taking classes there and in uh, iconic subscription the benefits of plus and two three more important thing you have a personal coach you have uh, your complete curriculum planned and there is test analysis this is the comparison that i was talking about and this i have to share with you because this is recently changed uh, it was revised on 24th of uh, october and the one month uh, plan is for 6300 12 month is 34 and if you want to go for 12 uh, 24 it is just 50 you know you can do little math one, uh, 12, one year is 34 and two years is just 50 so longer the duration better it is financially and don't forget to use this code to get 10 percent discount this is for iconic here also you know the thing is if you go for one year it is 58 and if you go for 24 months that is two years it is 90 so it is not getting doubled here also you're getting advantage and use this code to get 10 percent off <coughs> okay first thing first the doubts good afternoon Hiren. Okay, uh, Hiren thought he was late, but I think Anusha just said that ma'am started now. All right, so any doubt in the part that we have done so far? If there is no doubt, then we can get started with the things which we have planned. So let me wait for a few seconds and if anybody writes anything, or just let me know if there is no doubt so that we can start no doubt Reshma says that what about others Anusha also says no doubt see uh, once we do a particular uh, thing in the class and you know this is uh, the difference between the physical class and the online class in physical class uh, the teacher is able to see your faces and when the faces are seen you know we are able to judge by your facial expressions whether it is clear or not here the only means of communication is your message so if you say uh, that there is no doubt then it is going to be clear if you don't say anything i'm going to assume that it is clear so it is better that you write if there is any doubt or no doubt so that we all are uh, aware that there is anything which is not clear amisha is talking about bronchi okay we will be talking about bronchi uh, as I told you that we will start with trachea only so trachea bronchi then the intercom all those uh, branchings we will talk about the lungs also 
<coughs> okay, so I guess uh, nobody has written anything, that means there is no doubt. Okay, so we are starting with bronchi, but the diagram which I'm going to make is going to be from the trachea part. So this is the trachea, we have discussed this in detail. And now we are talking about the trachea. It goes through our neck region, it enters into our uh, chest cavity, and then it divides into two branches. Okay, this side is the left side, and this side is the right side. So the branch which goes towards the left will be called the left bronchus. Okay, now left bronchus is more or less horizontal. And the right bronchus, it is like little more vertical. <clears throat> now, I'm sure you are able to see the difference between the two bronchi. Okay, so this one is the left bronchus, and this is the right bronchus and these are the primary bronchi so primary bronchi are two one left bronchus and one right one left and one right now do you see any difference between these two bronchi the left one is more horizontal and the right one is more vertical. It is more vertical. <clears throat> the reason is the left lung has that cardiac notch. So it horizontally enters into the lung. Now here we will draw the lung also so that we know what happens to the primary and the secondary bronchi. And here itself we will talk about the lungs also. <clears throat> we will not go into the details but the right lung has three lobes and the left lung has two lobes. So the primary bronchi they divide into the secondary bronchi. So from here the first branching is going to be like this. In this case also there will be two branches, one branch going into each lobe. So if we are talking about the secondary bronchi, then there are three in right lung and two in left lung okay so there are total five secondary bronchi then the secondary bronchi will further divide and we will have the tertiary branches so if you're talking about the tertiary bronchi then there are ten tertiary bronchi in the right lung and eight in the left lung. That means this divides into so there are total ten tertiary bronchi in the right lung and here there are eight. These numbers are also asked. So two primary bronchi, then three secondary bronchi in the right lung and two in the left lung because one goes into each lobe. The right lung has three lobes, so three are secondary and the left lobe has, uh, left lung has two lobes, superior and inferior, so there are only two uh, secondary and then the tertiary. So further branching will take place. So this is the difference between the two. 
Now, let us talk about the next structure. Is the bronchi part clear? The primary, secondary and tertiary. Who had the doubt on bronchi? Amisha. So, and you know, one more thing here. All the bronchi are having the C-shaped cartilage, cartilaginous rings. So, trachea, primary, secondary, even tertiary have these cartilaginous rings. So, just draw one so that we know that these rings are present in all. So, <coughs> cartilaginous C-shaped cartilaginous rings are present in bronchi all primary secondary and tertiary bronchi okay so amisha now you have understood everything that's very good now let us come to the lung the structure of lung we have already talked of we'll quickly go over this structure which we have already done and that is the right lung and the left one which has this cardiac notch see these are triangular structure the apex is slightly pointed or triangular and the base is wider this left lung has this depression which is called the cardiac notch <coughs> and both the lungs are protected by a double membraned pleura so this also we made the inner one that is the visceral membrane is in contact with the lung wall and the second one that is the parietal membrane that is in contact with the thoracic wall. So if we have to draw this, here is this thoracic wall and the ones which we have drawn in green are the pleural membranes. So this one inner that is visceral. And the outer one is the parieta. And these two together form the pleura. Okay. Uh, the right lung is bigger, heavier and it has three lobes. You can see those uh, three lobes when we draw the diagram. So this is superior lobe. This is middle lobe and this is the inferior lobe. This is right lung. And the left lung has only two. This is superior lobe and inferior lobe. Okay, now let us have a comparative thing between the right lung and the left lung. We can write the points here that the right lung is larger and has three lobes. The left lung is smaller and has two lobes. Okay, this is clear from the diagram itself. Keep asking the doubts if you have any. Okay? The right is bigger and it weighs about 620 grams approximately. And the left is smaller and weighs about 580 grams approximately. So, Payan, your message was too big. I could not uh, read it and you deleted that message.
Okay, we will write one more comparative point. In the right lung, there is no cardiac notch, whereas in the left one, there is a cardiac notch. Okay, so uh, these differences are there in our lungs. And one thing which we know is that the primary bronchus goes in, it divides into secondary, the secondary divide into tertiary, tertiary divide into even finer branches and ultimately the finest branch would enter into an alveolar sac. So ultimately the air which we breathe in goes up to those alveolar sacs and each alveolar sac is made up of about 7, 8 such alveoli. So this one semicircular structure is an alveolus and this whole thing is called the alveolar sac. So all the branches that we are talking of finally open into a balloon like structure, a sac like structure and a sac has many alveoli, normally the number of alveoli is around 8 or 10. Okay, so structure of Uh, it was not related to the ongoing topic. I'll ask it in the doubt session. Okay. Uh, what is the notch ka kya kaam hai? Amisha is asking. See, this is the place where the heart is located. So, here is the location of the heart. So, for heart to be accommodated, there has to be a space. Okay. So, this is the space where the heart is placed and that is why when we talk of, uh, of our heart, we say it is located slightly on the left side of our chest cavity and is tilted also towards left. And the reason is there is a space or place for the heart. So, in case of normal individuals, the heart is located in the cardiac notch. But there is a very, very, very rare situation that the heart can be located on the right side. Have you heard of that situation? Very rare, very, very rare. Uh, I have read it in the books that the heart can be on the uh, right side also and in all these years of my teaching experience only once I had a student who had his heart on the right side and Hiren says you have seen it in a movie yes I also saw it in a movie but in reality because you know you read things in the books it is given in the books that means this situation have been reported but unless and until you see a person you meet a person who has that situation so in last 23 24 years of my teaching career i have seen or i have met only one student who had the heart on the right side movie is a different thing <clears throat> and do you know what is this condition known as It's a very rare situation. Tell, uh, see, those who have attended my <coughs> genetics class, the principles of inheritance, and those who have attended the cytoplasmic inheritance uh, part, they should be able to answer this question. Uh, Anjali is saying but the heart is in the middle only tilted on the left side. No, heart is slightly on the left and tilted on the left. How many of you attended that shell coiling uh, thing? Cytoplasmic inheritance. The special class which I took on the Unacademy learning app. completely 
heart shifted towards right yes instead of this the heart is going to be here okay amisha is saying that it is called dextrocardia and you're right because in <coughs> shell coiling we say dextrous and sinistral dextral and sinistral so it is called dextrocardia if heart is on right side and these cases have been reported though the percentage is very 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 less less than one person so this cardiac notch is the place where our heart is located now we have shown the lungs spaced apart one lung is here there is a big space but normally the space is very less and in this space if the heart is placed it is going to press, press both the structures so both the lungs are like this and then the left one has a depression like this so there is proper space given to the heart okay so uh, most of you were not aware and because you did not attend those classes probably that's why you were not knowing that dextral is for right handed and sinistral is for the left handed well anyways so this is the structure of the heart that we are talking about and we have already compared the left and the right lung uh, there itself now what exactly is this diaphragm diaphragm is a muscular it is a muscular structure which separates the thoracic cavity or chest cavity and abdominal cavity which separates chest cavity and abdominal cavity so if you draw that this is the chest cavity and we make the two lungs also here so this is the right lung and here is this left lung and the diaphragm is a muscular structure which is going to separate the chest cavity from the thoracic cavity. So this is chest cavity, this one. And here is abdominal cavity. So this is the abdominal part where all the abdominal organs like small intestine, stomach, liver, large intestine and all those things will be present, even kidneys. So upper abdominal, middle, lower, you know, all those things. So it completely separates. It's a muscular structure at rest that means when it is not contracting or when relaxed it is dome shaped it is not a flat structure it is dome shaped structure right you can make it flat you can make it even more dome like but normally it is a curved structure or uh, slightly dome shaped and it is one structure which is uh, going to help in breathing helps in breathing how it helps in breathing that we will understand once we come to the breathing mechanism so normally it is resting when the diaphragm is relaxed then it is dome shaped it is going to help in breathing and uh, it also helps uh, in breathing and we will take that point later on that if the animals are four-legged animals and if the animals are like us two-legged then which structure is a better or more important structure for breathing is it the diaphragm or is it the ribcage 
okay that we will talk after we are uh, done with the mechanism of breathing now we are talking about this branchial intercom what will happen if there is no diaphragm if there is no diaphragm the chest cavity is not going to be an airtight cavity and breathing will not be possible so the person may not survive or rather will not survive okay now i'm sure you uh, being a bio student you always sit with multicolored pens or pencils and this is what we will need now because we will use a different color for a different branch okay so let me start with trachea so that we know what is this branchial intercom branchial intercom is the tubular network which is found in the lungs so this is nothing but tubular network in our respiratory system so let us start with this that is trachea so now we are not going to go into details of this only thing is you have to use a different color and write the label this is trachea trachea divides into the primary bronchi so here don't worry about which one is horizontal and which one is more vertical our main focus is only on the branching next and next and next this is primary bronchus primary bronchus is going to divide into secondary bronchi secondary bronchi divide into tertiary bronchi so you have to just show it at one place okay we, we are not going to do it in every branch so this is tertiary bronchus okay so far clear <coughs> okay so uh, you know hiren is saying that he is using multiple colors uh, it is always beneficial it is always helpful when you have multiple colors because you know <coughs> our pictorial memory helps many a times <coughs> i don't know whether it happens with you or not but it happens with me when i make a diagram on the board or uh, whenever i'm teaching i and if i have to revise it after 2 3 4 days and if i have to make students remember something or make them recall something i am even able to tell that you know i made a diagram on this side of the board with green pen or with red pen so that pictorial thing is uh, it is very very helpful कंडक्टिंग पार्ट कहां तक होता है विच कंडक्टिंग पार्ट आर वी टॉकिंग अबाउट विच कंडक्टिंग पार्ट आर वी टॉकिंग अबाउट इट इज पीयूष कुमार स्वामी हैज ज्वाइन हेलो विच कंडक्टिंग पार्ट आर वी टॉकिंग अबाउट so let me know uh, are we talking about only the tube part or something else okay after tertiary bronch uh, bronchi the next branch they are called bronchioles now we will stop here and we will go back and what we will do is we will add one thing just one 
one C shaped ring here in the trachea. We'll add a ring here in primary bronchus. We'll make a ring here in the secondary bronchus and tertiary bronchus. So this is just a reminder to us that these cartilaginous rings are present in bronchi. So bronchioles are the first tubes without <coughs> cartilaginous support. And they are about one millimeter in diameter. So the question which was asked was that which is the narrowest tube that is without uh, these uh, uh, cartilaginous rings. Okay. So bronchial uh, the question was asked <coughs> can you get PDF of this class? Uh, I really I'm not sure like uh, how do I share the PDF of a session which I'm taking on a YouTube channel because I know that if the classes are conducted on the app which I'm taking on an academy app those uh, lectures are available to the students after 40 45 minutes in the form of PDF so you can see the recorded ones you get the PDF also uh, I am not very sure about how can I share this with you but let me try I'll find it out and uh, then I'll let you know okay okay now uh, this is uh, our bronchiole and after bronchiole the branching is going to continue so now the next branch that we have is called terminal bronchiole okay uh, terminal bronchiole after terminal bronchiole there is one more branching and this okay uh, Hiren and Kumar Swami give me a day or two I'll find it out and I'll definitely share it with you how I can uh, share those PDFs with you okay after this there is one more time that is branching and this is known as the respiratory bronchiole we have still not reached the alveoli Okay, Amisha also wants the PDF. Yes, I'll let uh, everybody know about it. Okay, so this is the respiratory bronchus or bronchiole or we can also call it bronchus. Okay, respiratory bronchus. Uh, one more branching and that is called, I'm going to shift the labels here. It is called the alveolar duct and alveolar duct opens into the alveolar sac so this structure is alveolar sac so uh, normally when we talk about our respiratory system our focus is on trachea bronchi at the most primary secondary and tertiary and we think that the air is going to reach up to the alveoli but it has to pass through so many branches and here we have drawn only one branch of each imagine if everything is like uh, branched and branched and branched so you have just a network of tubes and that is what is known as the branchial intercom now when we are talking about this alveolar sac and this one semicircular part is an alveolus or alveolar 
or multiple are known as alveoli. So what we'll do is it is a part of the structure of lung and we can talk about it here also. Suppose we talk about this alveolar sac. This alveolar sac has about 8, 9 or 10 alveoli. So each one is an alveolus and all of these together will be called the alveolar sac. The lining, the alveolus is lined with a simple squamous epithelium. Lined with simple squamous epithelium. Okay, but this is the thinnest possible epithelium through which diffusion of respiratory gases is going to take place and the alveoli are highly vascular. That means near each alveolus there is a blood vessel. So they are highly vascularized richly supplied with blood so that as soon as oxygen diffuses in it the oxygen can be taken by blood and that means this membrane of alveolus is acting as a respiratory membrane so this membrane which we have drawn is the respiratory membrane and we know the characteristic features of respiratory membrane it should be moist and here there are mucus glands or mucus cells which are going to secrete the mucus. So on the inner side there is a thin layer of mucus. The oxygen which is going to come here will first dissolve into this mucus and then it will be taken in. Now here we will add one very very important thing that alveoli are lined with lecithin. What is lecithin? Lecithin acts as a surfactant. That means it prevents the alveoli from collapsing. So this lecithin which is a phospholipid it present in the lining of these alveoli and it protects those alveoli from collapsing. So at the end of uh, the intercom we have uh, the alveolar sac and each sac has alveoli. Uh, do alveolar ducts have radius comparable to that of capillaries? Capillaries have even smaller uh, radius, even smaller. Shubhra has joined now. Okay, so is this intercom clear? How many branches are there? And we purposefully use different colors so that we are able to see this. So there is trachea, then primary, secondary, tertiary bronchi. And these tubes are supported by these cartilaginous rings. Then starts with bronchiole, which is uh, the branch or the widest branch which is without any uh, cartilaginous support. So terminal bronchus or bronchiole, respiratory bronchiole or bronchus. Then there are alveolar duct and then alveolar sac. Okay, so some of you are writing that it is absolutely clear. So I hope it is clear to everyone. Amisha, Hiren, Anusha, they have written that it is absolutely clear to them. And function of this lecithin also. Which is uh, 
a phospholipid okay so we talk about this in biomolecule chapter also reshma also says it is clear okay if this part is clear then let us come to mechanism of breathing now our breathing cycle it has two parts or it is completed in two parts the breathing cycle is completed in two parts one is inhalation or it is also known as inspiration or inspiration more is inspiration then exhalation or expiration or expiration so people say it inspiration or inspiration expiration or expiration more commonly used words are inhalation and exhalation inhalation and exhalation out of these two one is an active process and one is a passive process which is active which is passive and how much time is required for this breathing cycle to take place how many times do you breathe in a minute can you tell me what is our breathing rate okay hiren anusha they are writing inhalation is active why is it active and how many times do we breathe in a minute <coughs> normally it is said as 12 to 14 times per minute this is our breathing rate okay 12 to 16 also is written at places so 12 to 14 12 to 16 times diaphragm is used okay we will talk about which muscles are used so let us talk about the first part that is inhalation inhalation involves contraction of two types of muscles so the first category of muscle which we are talking about they are called phrenic muscles or they are also known as radial muscles phrenic muscles or radial muscles now where are these muscles attached these muscles are attached at one end to the diaphragm and the other end to the rib cage okay so for this we will have to understand that if this is the thoracic wall here are the ribs and we are seeing a section so these ribs have been cut okay and let us make that diaphragm which we made in the previous part this is the diaphragm which is in normal condition dome shaped slightly curved these muscles are attached between the thoracic wall and the diaphragm you will have to visualize it that if this diaphragm is a complete sheet then the muscles are attached to the periphery of the diaphragm and then to the thoracic wall or to the rib cage so the muscles are like this so they are radial muscles as if they are radiating from here okay so from the diaphragm to the rib cage from the diaphragm to the thoracic wall this is how they are attached now imagine if a dome shaped structure is like this and there are all these muscles attached all along its periphery 
what will happen when these muscles contract when this muscle contracts it is going to pull it from here it is going to pull it from here the diaphragm is going to become flat so these phrenic muscles first they are attached to diaphragm and thoracic wall between diaphragm and thoracic wall second when they contract what happens to the diaphragm diaphragm flattens it is dome shaped it becomes flat it flattens now what will happen if this diaphragm which was dome shaped becomes flat right the original position of diaphragm was this and after contraction this is the position of the diaphragm so what has happened to the volume of thoracic cavity this results in increase in the volume of thoracic cavity so volume of thoracic cavity is increasing this is first muscle and we will write one point here or we will write the points separately after discussing the second muscle the second type of muscles are called external intercostal muscles external intercostal muscles where are they present they are present between the ribs between the ribs so can you guess the number of these external intercostal muscles how many ribs do we have and because normally left and right side we have same number we normally say how many pairs of ribs do we have so how many pairs of ribs do we have and if we know the number of ribs we can also know the number of these muscles external intercostal ayush says we have 12 pairs of ribs so how many intercostal muscles external intercostal muscles will we have Dilip also says 12 pairs of ribs okay now give me the number of muscles Amisha is writing 24 i guess this is for the ribs we have 24 yes 12 on each side so normally we write uh, 12 pairs 24 muscles Hiren is asking 11 Reshma says 11 Joseph says 11 pairs Hiren says 22 muscles see if this is a rib this is another rib this is another rib this is another rib and if the muscles are present between them then you know the muscles are going to be here so if there are four ribs you will have three muscles between the ribs so if we have 12 pairs of uh, ribs we'll have 11 pairs 11 pairs of these muscles and we have given the name as external intercostal that means there will be internal intercostal muscles also not right now we'll talk about it later on so what exactly are these muscles and what exactly uh, rather these two muscles will do suppose we are talking about the external intercostal muscles when they contract 
the rib cage rib cage is like this it's a it these are all ribs and it makes a cage around the lungs and the heart so this is the rib cage now when these muscles contract the external intercostal the rib cage moves out and up okay so we'll write that point here when these muscles contract rib cage moves up and out what will happen if the rib cage moves up and out this results in increase in the volume of thoracic cavity so when phrenic muscles contracted the dome shaped diaphragm becomes flat when external intercostal muscles contract the rib cage moves up and out both these things result in the same thing what is happening this and this point same volume of thoracic cavity increases and we know when the volume increases what happens to the pressure inside the cavity pressure in the cavity decreases now tell me the rib cage is moving up and out you need to watch this diagram carefully the rib cage is going to move here so this is the new position of the ribs this is the new position of diaphragm this is the new position of rib cage now when the rib cage moves out the thoracic wall also goes out if thoracic wall goes out what happens to the lung wall the lung was here the lung membrane is here attached to the thoracic wall so that also goes out that means the lung is also expanding here or being stretched here so cavity the pressure in the lungs decreases this is called a negative pressure is generated negative and negative is nothing but suction so it is called intra pulmonary pressure so when rib cage moves up and out diaphragm from dome becomes flat the volume of thoracic cavity increases intra pulmonary volume decreases and air moves from higher pressure to lower pressure so after this the air moves from atmosphere that is higher pressure to lungs into lungs that is lower pressure air has gone into the lungs this is inhalation and because these muscles are contracting inhalation is an active process active processes when atp or energy is required and energy is required for muscles to contract intercostal uh, word uh, intercostal word is normally used for the between the rib space at how much depth can we breathe in water see it totally depends on uh, the water body so more the water the pressure is going to be more and if the pressure is more the wall is not going to stretch so water is going to exert pressure on your thoracic wall on the chest cavity so 
that rib cage will not be able to move out and if it is not able to move out the intrapulmonary pressure will uh, not decrease and if it doesn't decrease you won't be able to breathe in and that is why we say that if you go deep in the water you your chest or your lungs get crushed they don't actually get crushed but the pressure doesn't let that breathing take place and that is why the air which is in those cylinders is under pressure <coughs> okay is inhalation part clear is inhalation clear two types of muscles phrenic or radial and external intercostal phrenic muscles are between diaphragm and the thoracic wall or the rib cage so they can be from here like this rib cage and the wall periphery of diaphragm to the rib cage or thoracic wall the inter external intercostal muscles are between the, the ribs so their number is fixed there are 11 pairs of these external intercostal muscles when phrenic muscles contract diaphragm becomes flat when external intercostal muscles contract the rib cage moves up and out both these things result in increase in the volume of thoracic cavity and that results in decrease in intrapulmonary pressure and because inside the lungs the pressure is low air has a tendency to move from higher pressure to lower so air will move from higher pressure that is atmosphere into the lungs that is low pressure that is inhalation and because the muscles are contracting this is active is inhalation part clear <coughs> Okay, Hiren, Ayush, Reshma, Misha, they have said it is clear. Uh, Joseph is asking about uh, the effect of altitude on lung function. See, at higher altitude, there is no direct effect on lung function. At higher altitude, the oxygen becomes less. And the normal hemoglobin that we have in our body is not sufficient to bind with that less oxygen. And that is why the person feels breathlessness, heaviness, nausea. This is uh, called mountain sickness. So you tend to breathe heavily because now your body's requirement is more and the availability of oxygen is less. So over a period of time, people who stay at higher altitudes, their RBC count increases because now they have to live in a condition where there is less oxygen. So how do you adapt to that? That is when more and more ox uh, hemoglobin is available. And how can um, hemoglobin be increased? Unless and until uh, RBCs are increased. Yes, mountain sickness, altitudinal sickness, these are the names given to that. <clears throat> so it is only the oxygen which is less now there at higher altitude okay let us come to exhalation part we have done the first that is inhalation now let us talk about the second step that is exhalation What happens during exhalation? Phrenic muscles, phrenic or radial muscles relax. When these muscles relax, what will happen? The diaphragm becomes dome shaped like original external intercoastal muscles also relax 
and when these muscles relax the rib cage moves in and down so now what is happening the diaphragm which became flat due to contraction of the phrenic muscles when the muscles relax again the diaphragm becomes dome shaped when external intercostal muscles contract the rib cage which was up and out again comes in and down so when all these things are coming back to their normal position what will happen to the volume of the chest cavity so these two things what are they going to result in volume of thoracic cavity decreases if volume decreases then intra pulmonary pressure increases that means inside the lungs there is higher pressure and air moves from higher pressure that is lungs to lower pressure that is atmosphere that means air from the lungs has been pumped or pushed out or it leaves the lungs this is exhalation which muscle is contracting here which muscle contracts during exhalation no muscle is contracting phrenic muscles are relaxing external intercostal are also relaxing and if there is no contraction of muscle then that means the process is passive so exhalation is a passive process okay is exhalation clear we inhale due to contraction of muscles we exhale due to relaxation of those muscles if this part is clear then we will talk about forceful exhalation normal inhalation is active normal exhalation is passive forceful exhalation is active we'll talk about it if this part is clear then we will talk about forceful exhalation now this is a special uh, situation forceful exhalation to understand this let us make that uh, diagram which we made this is the normal position of the thoracic wall and let us make that diaphragm also here this is the normal position of the diaphragm during inhalation the diaphragm becomes flat okay and the rib cage moves up and out so this is the normal position this is normal position of diaphragm and the thoracic wall and this is the position during inhalation okay now we are talking about forceful inhalation 
so when normal ex, uh, sorry force, forceful exhalation so now when after inhalation normal exhalation takes place so what will happen is diaphragm will go back to its place rib cage will also go back to its place during forceful exhalation again there are muscles which are involved and that is why when muscles are there and they are contracting then it is going to be an active process the muscles are called internal intercostal muscles these are also present between the ribs but only on the inner side external extracostal uh, external intercostal are towards the outer side and the internal ones are on the inner side they are also between the ribs and so their number will again be 11 pairs okay now what happens when these muscles contract when these muscles contract rib cage moves further in and down now this is the normal position of the rib cage after normal exhalation see what happens is normal inhalation the rib cage goes up and out exhalation it comes back now forceful exhalation the rib cage goes even in again this is the normal rib cage position during inhalation the rib cage moves up and out the volume increases inside exhalation it comes down and in forceful it goes even in and down so if it is going in and down what will happen to the volume of thoracic cavity further decreases and if the volume decreases pressure will increase and so intra pulmonary pressure increases and we know air is going to move from higher pressure area to lower pressure area so it will move out but here the muscle is contracting so when the air is moving out that means we are exhaling but this is forceful exhalation second muscle or the second type of muscles they are called abdominal muscles <coughs> now these abdominal muscles are actually attached to the abdominal organs like suppose here is stomach and intestine so these muscles are attached between the abdominal organs and the diaphragm so what will happen when these muscles are contracted they are present between visceral organs and diaphragm so when these muscles contract these organs are pulled up so when the exhalation normal exhalation has taken place the diaphragm has become dome shaped now if the abdominal muscles contract that means suppose this is the stomach and if the muscle between the diaphragm and the stomach contracts it is going to pull the stomach closer to the diaphragm or intestine closer to the diaphragm so if stomach or intestine pushes this diaphragm it becomes even more dome shaped right so when these muscles contract the diaphragm becomes even more dome shaped 
so now what is the position the diaphragm instead of normal dome has become like this the rib cage of instead of the normal position has come in so what is happening to the volume of thoracic cavity so volume of thoracic cavity further decreases <coughs> this results in increase in pressure <coughs> and if pressure is increasing then air moves out that is exhalation and because it was because of the contraction of the muscles you call it forceful exhalation <clears throat> so normal inhalation active normal exhalation passive forceful exhalation active amisha is asking visceral viscera is the term given to all the organs which are present in the abdominal cavity like liver stomach intestine kidney all these so you can call it visceral organs you can call them abdominal organs okay now tell me how much part is clear and what are the doubts so that we can discuss those doubts first why hiran is saying why i try to completely exhale air at last my abdomen muscles get contracted not clear hiran what exactly are you trying to ask you cannot empty your lungs there is always some air no matter how forcefully you try you cannot empty your lungs the lungs always have some air which is called the residual volume <clears throat> pulmonary ka meaning pulmonary is the word used for lungs so inside the lungs intrapulmonary we use pulmonary word for lungs the respiration through lungs is called pulmonary respiration uh joseph is asking can you explain anatomical dead space yes i will in the next class in detail but i'll tell you uh we just now made the intercom right if i take you back to that uh right so now uh we normally inhale 500 ml of air which is called our tidal volume now when that air is inhaled some air remains in these tubes and some will reach up to the alveoli so the air which remains in the tubes in this part through that air there is no exchange of gases taking place so it is basically a dead space and it is our anatomy it is our structure so that is why it is known as anatomical dead space we will talk about this detail the volumes and everything when we come to pulmonary volumes how can contraction of phrenic muscles cause flattening of diaphragm if you know the location then you will be able to understand it diaphragm is a circular disc like thing right and the muscles are attached all along the periphery of this disc from here to the rib cage from here to the thoracic wall like this so if there is a thread here which is pulling it from all the peripheral parts then it will be stretched on all the sides and it will become flat contraction should call pull it is pulling 
so if it is a dome shaped structure and you are pulling from the peripheral part then it is going to become flat <clears throat> okay so i was talking about this anatomical dead space which i said we will be discussing in detail later on okay mechanism of breathing clear one breathing cycle has one inhalation one exhalation now can you tell me which one out of the two takes longer inhalation takes longer or exhalation takes longer i don't want the answer right now you can experience it do it on your daily uh, like at home also when you're sitting there how much time inhalation how much time exhalation so which one requires more time <clears throat> i said i don't want the answer right now you experience it do it when you're relaxed and then you give me the answer of this okay so we will talk about this tomorrow which one takes longer inhalation or exhalation see i started getting both the answers some say inhalation some say exhalation all right let's quickly go over the breathing mechanism we said there are two parts inhalation and exhalation inhalation requires contraction of muscles there are two types of muscles but before that we need to know the position the rib cage is at its position the diaphragm at rest is dome shaped when the phrenic muscles contract the radial muscles or the phrenic muscles then the diaphragm becomes flat when the external intercostal muscles contract the rib cage moves up and out both these things result in increase in the volume of the thoracic cavity and because thoracic cavity and the pleura are attached so inside the lungs also the volume increases pressure decreases and air moves from higher pressure that is atmosphere to lower pressure that is into our lungs this is inhalation two types of muscles both contracting so we call it active process now both these types of muscles relax so when external intercostal relax the rib cage comes back to its position down and in when phrenic muscles relax the diaphragm which got flat again becomes dome shaped so now what happens to the thoracic cavity its volume decreases and because the lung wall is attached to this volume of the lung will also decrease pressure increases and air always moves from higher pressure that is from lungs to lower pressure that is atmosphere both the types of muscles are relaxing so we call exhalation as a passive process what about forceful exhalation so normally when we exhale if we put efforts we are able to exhale some more air but when you do that you can experience that your belly region goes in so here again two types of muscles are there internal intercostal muscles and abdominal muscles internal intercostal muscles are again between the ribs and abdominal muscles are between the visceral organs and the diaphragm so this is the diaphragm so between the organ and the diaphragm there would be the muscles when these muscles contract the rib cage goes in further in diaphragm which is normally dome shaped is now pushed by the organs from the lower side so it becomes even more dome shaped both these things will result in decrease in the volume of the thoracic cavity volume decreases pressure increases that means there is now more pressure in the lungs so air from the lungs will be thrown out exhalation and we are calling it forceful because here the muscles are contracting so forceful exhalation is active normal inhalation is active normal exhalation is passive and we have to <coughs> 
and we have to remember these uh, names of the muscles okay um, amisha is saying that she is suffering from rhinitis okay so uh, did you take any medicine or uh, some kind of a treatment and is it allergic or the weather change what is the reason for this rhinitis see uh, people in this class they don't get cold they don't suffer from running nose they have a technical disease now which is called rhinitis nothing it will uh, get uh, all right in 2 3 days time so you know uh, when you get into medical college and you know you start studying the books there there is a phrase written for the cold that if you treat it it gets cured in 7 days if you don't treat it it gets cured in one week that means whether you do something you take a medicine or you don't do anything it will take its own time and our body's defense mechanism is such that even if you don't take any medicine then it will be cured on its own because of our defense mechanism okay karan why so late the class is going to get over in 5 minutes uh ma'am is it true that we can train these respiratory muscles see muscles can be toned you cannot train a muscle you can tone a muscle like what the the people who uh, bod who are bodybuilders they tone the muscle so if you tone a muscle the capacity of that muscle to do work increases so you can tone it and that is why there are breathing exercises in yoga and all uh cuff ke liye there is no such name uh there is a name because cuff is uh, due to variety of things and there can be various things like it can just be irritation in a particular part like if it is around larynx then you call it laryngitis if it is in the pharynx you call it pharyngitis so it depends right but if it is in nose then you call it rhinitis so if you are able to locate that the cough is because of uh, La infection in larynx or in pharynx then you can use that name but whenever it is in larynx your voice also gets affected <clears throat> uh any other you knew general problems ke name like rhinitis oh there are many i'll keep giving you as and when we come across that particular uh, part okay now tell me whatever we did today is that part clear are you able to understand the breathing mechanism the names of the muscles and why one process is active and the other is passive the difference between the right and the left lungs the branchial intercom these are the things that we have talked off so let us discuss this first any any confusion yes we will talk in biological terms okay reshma <coughs> and joseph Hiren, they are all saying it is all clear. So let me ask the other students who have not said anything yet. Yes, after the experiment, it will be clear. That means you just sit, uh, uh, like in a relaxed condition after the class. Try to inhale. Try to exhale. Try to forcefully exhale. and in the next class we will be doing more of such experiments because we will be talking about the pulmonary volumes 
<coughs> all right so this is i think uh, clear to everyone because no one is asking any doubt and all of you have written that it is clear thanks joseph i'm glad you understood everything all right this is our last thing that don't forget to subscribe to the youtube channel don't forget to take the subscription in case if you have not use this code that is my code neela and get the advantage of 10% discount okay so i will see you tomorrow same time that is 12:30 those who have joined in late they need to join in at the right time so that we don't miss out on anything and what we will be doing tomorrow is again very very interesting thing have a nice day everyone and i'll see you tomorrow